Hello, hi everybody, everyone out here, everyone watching at home. I'm Jackie and this is the ECCC live stage. And I am joined by a person who I don't, I think we all know, needs no introduction, um, but Gwendolyn Christie. I'm so excited that you're here. Hi, thank you all yeah. for coming. Woo! Oh my goodness. Um, so I gotta ask right away, has it completely sunk in that you're done filming Game of Thrones? I actually don't think it has. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a funny thing, you know, that the show has been such a huge part of my working life, you know, and, and part of my life, and it's so uh, beloved that actually you kind of got used to with the show that you would go and you'd film it, and uh, you felt like you were having this sort of private experience of the work because you love the work and you love the people you're working with. And then you'd go home and you'd go back to your life. And then I'd always be shocked that it was on television. <laughs> I know it's ludicrous, but I'd be so shocked at this sort of private experience that I was having it was watched by all these people. Um, and it is increasingly emotional to think that it will be the last series. But, you know, they really squeeze the orange on this one. <laughs> so I think it will be very memorable for everybody. Oh, okay. Um, I won't ask. Um, <laughs> so what was, what was that last day, that last scene of shooting for you like? So it was incredibly emotional, sad, a little happy? I don't know. I mean, people keep asking me this, and, and I think the more... The more I think about it and the more you get in contact with it, the clearer idea you start to have of it. But I told myself for a long time, be prepared that one day this will end. Yeah. But of course, you know, the thing is, the amazing thing about Game of Thrones is that, of course, normally for actors, if you do a TV show, you feel like you have some kind of regular employment and that allows you a great stability. Not so with Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. Because True. instead, each year, you know, it doesn't matter. You just don't, you never know what's going to happen. So, and David and Dan, the writers, yeah. uh, David Benioff and, and Dan Weiss, had always said the very worst death they thought that they could imagine was to die off screen. Uh, so each year yeah. you think, well, even though at the end of this series I seem to be alive, what if the scripts arrive and there's just the, someone comes in and saying, oh, wasn't it a shame that Brienne just spontaneously combusted? <laughs> that would so, be cruel. You know, so, the, so but it, what was good is that it really, it didn't, it meant you never got lazy about it. Mm. But in answer to your question, um, I have prepared myself, you know, this is going to come and I will be upset, but actually nothing could really prepare me for it. And it was, you know, coming up to the end of the day and of course the showrunners were doing this, you know, something for us whereby they, you know, they would announce that you were wrapped and they would say a few words. And I told myself, just breathe, it's fine. I'm lucky that I ever had this job. And they said something nice about me and then I just started to sob. Uh, and I didn't stop for <laughs> two hours. No. And so I'm going into hair and like having things taken out of my hair and the makeup take, she's still going. And I'm walking off to costume having things, to go, she's still going. And then I'm going saying goodbye to someone else, still going. And people are saying, and literally crew members are saying, she's still going. Stop crying. No, nope, she's still going. And it was hugely emotional, but I think it's important to really, you know, let those things out. But I'm imagining that when, you know, once the show is on and it finishes, then that really will feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's ending. Yeah. That will be its, its it, the finality. I'm not looking Sobbing for two to... weeks, I would imagine. That's what I'm <laughs> scheduling in. Just a two-week-long sobbing session. Just sort of a period of mourning. Yeah, and then, and then right back, back ready to work. <laughs> but you need that time. Can you, is it personal or can you tell us what they said? Or is it like, that's just for me? 
I think that's just for me yep. and probably for the behind the scenes documentary you will all see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we'll find out there. So is there anything, something that fascinates me about the show is there are so many people and locations. Is there any one actor or um, location or character that you wish you'd gotten more time or more experience with um, that maybe, you know, just by virtue of the story, you just didn't? Well, the easy answer, of course, is all of them. Yeah. Because I am a fan of the show and I do love the characters in it, but Michelle Fairley, Catelyn Stark, yeah. who always felt like the real heart of the show. Absolutely. She felt like the mother of the show. And she really led the company, too, in terms of, uh, of uh, as a group of actors. She really, she led us all. And, 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 you know, I hadn't really done a lot of screen work. I'd, I'd acted, but I hadn't done a lot of screen work. So um, Michelle helped, really taught me an awful lot and was incredibly kind and and extremely funny, but she took care of me and was, and was enormously encouraging. And I felt a, a strong sense of, um, you know, there was a proper friendship and a female solidarity there, which enables you to go forward with confidence. And I also loved in the books the whole storyline of um, Lady Stoneheart. Yeah. That I was really looking forward to. Yeah. Um, but you know, hopefully, fingers crossed, Michelle and I will work on something else. Yeah. Well, Ho I mean, hopefully. The behind the scenes doc, you guys. <laughs> yeah, and in the yeah. behind the scenes documentary. <laughs> so is there anything that you won't miss? That goodbye, good luck, I won't miss that. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> the armor mm -hmm. is incredible but I will not miss the physical pain sure. of that particular costume. So it is, it is incredibly, it is actually heavy. It is, is it actually made to be armor? Is that, you know, could, could you get in a fight in it? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I mean, the, yeah, I suppose yeah. you could. I mean, it was made for me, which, and it was beautifully designed yeah. by Michelle Clapton. I mean, the, what an incredible job. It was all so, her design was so personal. And of course, the, the best design is, is that it's, in per, it's very personal. Uh, the references are very clear, but they're also really, they're interpreted. And, and it resulted in this phenomenal world. So, I mean, I basically have had fights in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it operates, it functions. But I think it weighed um, something like uh, two and a half stone. And for those of us who don't, what is that? Sorry, I'm Doing British. <laughs> and from, clearly from 1931. <laughs> uh, what is that? Two and a half stone. How much? 25. 35. 35. 35 pounds. 35 pounds, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. 35. <laughs> um, so do you know how everything ends, every storyline ties out? Or are there surprises for you as well in the final six episodes? Well, I thought I knew. Huh. But then I saw some articles saying that um, uh, multiple endings have been filmed. Whoa. And I also know, I found out last week that uh, the HBO series Big Love also filmed multiple endings. So maybe I don't know, but maybe I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's torture. Um, so how hard is it? Uh, I know we're joking, but to not be able to talk about your work for so long, obviously you can talk about your work, but to have to, um, yeah, I guess not talk about the specifics of things that you've shot or, um, and then you have, you know, people like me who are dying to know. Is it, is it a challenge to kind of keep so much of that to yourself for so long? Yep. <laughs> I mean, initially, it was so strange because 
I was doing this incredible job, even though I, saw, I started in series two. So at that point, the show wasn't the kind of spectacular, uh, successful phenomena that it is now. Yeah. Um, but it, but people, people were excited about it. But I, I couldn't talk about what I was doing at work. And so that was very strange because, you know, I wanted to show off because I'd finally got a job. <laughs> um, but, you know, I learned over time that you can take a certain pride in wanting to keep those secrets because really what it's about, I think, is that, you know, now we have so much information. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have the internet in our pocket. We have uh, access to multiple worlds. Uh, multiple universes, the kind of information that uh, we never thought we could have access to and many things that we don't understand and, and increased learning of the things that we do know. And there is so much information now that the idea of there being something as old-fashioned as a story. Mm -hmm. And I really think there is nothing as powerful as a good story. And the idea of keeping that a secret so that we can all be held in this incredible, almost childlike wonder about what will happen next. And now we don't really have so much of a culture of live experience. We experience things through a device, through a screen. Um, and instead of there being a live experience where we all feel something together and you feed off each other's energy and you can't help but become infected by that energy, now we have this other new world where we have a story that we're desperate to know what's going to happen and as a consequence we're all held by it and we're all communicating with each other across the world about it you know yeah so and we're all finding that story out together and even the way that people watch episodes but they don't they don't leak spoilers it's a wonderful kind of respect for a story. It's a respect for the human experience that we can all share something and be swept away and, and to be frank, taken out of our, our lives and how challenging they can be. Yeah. So with all of that in mind, it's even harder to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> but it, it, that's what I, what I want to do. So, so I, don't, I don't, I don't. And also to be frank, you know, no one needs to know anything more about me and my boring life and views and opinions. So it um, puts me in a much better place to actually ask someone else yeah. about what they're doing. And, and that will be more interesting for me too. Yeah. And then I can show off about it at the end. And then, yeah. Then at the end, I can show off about everything I've done. <laughs> Only at the end. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that is, there is um, the, you know, the concept of appointment television that we sit down, we watch it together. It's a communal experience, not just with the people you're watching it with, but with everybody that you know is sitting in front of their TV and, at the same time. And it's this funny. extends now beyond the sort of cinematic experience or theatrical experience of maybe there being, you know, a large theatre with 2,000 people watching a play or a concert where there's maybe 22,000 people. This is, this is a global experience. Yeah. And I think that's part of what makes it so magical, is that we can actually all be united through a love of this thing. Yep, same place, same time, and we all feel a million different ways about it, but yeah. Ah. Um, okay, so one of my favorite parts of the show, and I think everyone's, is the relationships are adult and nuanced. Um, and I want to ask you about some of the relationships that Brienne has had with various people um, and get your take as an actor, you know, what was really kind of going on in your process. So um, the first is going back is uh, Renly. So how, um, we, we've heard different points and at one point she pretty explicitly um, lays out what the feelings were, but as an actor, did you, did you feel it was the truth that, you know, Brienne wasn't in, in love, in quotes with Renly? Um, is she being honest there? Or, yeah, like, how, how did you feel uh, playing that relationship? Oh, that's interesting. Why do you think she wouldn't be being honest? I don't know. Well, I think she was badgered so much about it. Yeah. Um, that, 
And at the point in time when she sort of lays out, this is, no, of course I wasn't in love with him, um, that maybe she's kind of done some work or gotten herself to the point, <laughs> done some done some work. Brianna's she's a therapist done some here. work on herself. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's read a self-help book and she's yeah. feeling, you know, she's feeling fresh and ready to give things to go in a new way. <laughs> this is the degree to which I'm thinking. I'm like, you know, um, okay, but Brienne's downloaded an app on mindfulness. Mm -hmm. She's using Headspace. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, you, so she's honest. She was not in love with Renly. It was admiration, friendship, not a romantic Well, it love. was very interesting in the scripts. I read, I read the books before I started the show. Mm -hmm. And I read them because it, it, it's part of the kind of training I've had is that you want to gather as much information as possible. And also, you know, I like to have as much information as possible. And that can make you more confident that you feel like you have something to hang on to. And I think that uh, I did, I kept referring back to the books at the beginning because this relationship, I didn't know how explicit it was that Brienne uh, was in, in, had these feelings to Renly. You sort of wonder why, why does she want to be a part of the Kingsguard so much? Mm -hmm. Why does she, why is she so distraught when he dies? You know, and it's interesting, isn't it? You know, the more I find out about filmmaking and television making, so much can be about just what happens on the, on the day. What a director says, more, make it more, make it bigger, go further, connect more to it. And then as an actor, it's your job to find the justification. And in the books, there is that, uh, one of the things I was really delighted about is that I felt that David and Dan uh, connected and solved this. Was it in the book, she talks about how she has this experience with Renly where he, uh, he doesn't laugh at her. Mm -hmm. and he dances with her, and he makes her feel accepted. And for that, uh, springs up out of that is a kind of, it's a mutual respect, and it's a gratitude and a love. And the purity of that sort of human act, you know, it's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? A, a friend of mine uh, recently, there was an incredible, incredible figure called Judy Blame, who's one of the most uh, notorious, uh, and earliest punks in, in London. And he said he felt that now that the most radical act that you can perform is to care for yourself and others. And I, I, think, that's, I think that's quite true. And, and I think there's a lot of that sort of respect for, uh, for basic acts of love yeah. from Brienne. And he is the first man to show her kindness rather than insult and disregard and, and abuse, I suppose. Um, and so she wants to protect him. She wants to give his, her life for him. Yeah. So I think it's, what's so wonderful about Game of Thrones is that it is, you know, you, it is incredibly nuanced and it's incredibly unique in its, in, it, in its exploration of human relationships. It's not just love as in, you know, I want to procreate with you. Right. It is. Um, it, it comes out of multiple ways, and and you're and you're not always sure what exactly it is, but you know that you recognize it. Yeah, yeah. That makes okay. I love that. It's <laughs> a lot of sense. Um, the next relationship I want to ask about is, uh, I'll say it was Sansa. My jersey is Sansa. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, well, Charles Dance said Sansa. Sansa, yeah, that sounds so much Which better. Which is my favorite, actually. Sansa. <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> we could do this for half an hour. Yeah. Sansa. <laughs> um, so, how do you feel uh, Brienne views her? Do you think that there is a complete trust the way there seemed to be with Catelyn, or is there a little bit more skepticism, but I'm bound to this person? Um, what, what, what do you think Brienne is feeling about her, where we left off? It's such an interesting question because uh, what we've been seeing very subtly over the series is Brienne develop as a person. Mm -hmm. And so initially, as we've just discussed, it's someone who is in service of an idea greater than herself. She's in service of another person who she believes can bring something more or, 
or, or, or something more worthy or more resourceful than she ever can. And we've seen her slowly develop over the seasons where she has more confidence. Mm -hmm. We see her strategic military sense develop, her greater confidence in her intellectual capability, and also the, the confidence in her own strength. Yeah. But she does deeply respect and adhere to the oath that she swore to Catelyn Stark to look after the Stark girls. But I think she has a lot of belief in Sansa. And I think that she, Sansa, I think that she, um, I think she really respects her and admires her because she can see that strength that her mother demonstrated in her. Mm -hmm. And she can see her desire to rule and, and to lead and, and an irrepressible ambition. Mm. So where she stands personally on that scale, I think that there are various moments from what we've seen so far where, you know, there's a range of um, attitudes or, 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 que or questioning or uh, not being sure about um, temperance. Yeah. Um, but I think that she supports her because that's been her oath. So, yeah, that's what she's going to do. Okay. Um, so there are a lot of people that Brienne is never going to get to fight because they're dead. Um, and I wanted to see who you think would have won in these matchups. Um, Oberyn versus Brienne. It's Brienne. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Is there really another answer? <laughs> He's done. Yeah, and he has very sensitive eyes, so you could actually <laughs> just maneuver him round to some quite strong sunlight and they'd explode. <laughs> Apparently, there was almost no pressure applied on the eyeballs at all. Okay. Just a ray of light cast across the eyeballs <laughs> and they just exploded of their own accord. That's, that's, act, that's in the behind the scenes documentary. <laughs> that's okay. what you're gonna find out, yeah. Uh, all right, so one to Brienne. Ned Stark versus Brienne. Ned Stark. Ooh. Was there an ooh from the There audience? was. There are ooh. Does that ooh indicate doubt? <gasps> I should hope it does not. For... You think he's a good matchup? Good matchup. You think he'd run Brienne ragged? Mm. I think, you know what, if they were having a kind of fight over uh, morals, strength of morals. Okay, if, they were doing, if they were doing a kind of, if the strength of their morals was coming out of their forehead like a laser, <laughs> As and they, they were sitting opposite each other, I think it would be like two magnets, two magnets, two magnets. Just dancing around each other and... But Brienne would win. Oh, I agree, actually, okay. Robert Baratheon in his prime versus Brienne. I can't, I like, I'm struggling to gain a visual. <laughs> of what, I, so I guess, get, you know. Because. Gendry? Oh. Because what? Well. I think he's all talk. Oh. Okay. He's I'll killed talk. by a pig. Oh, uh, well, so my next question. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> he's killed by a pig. Who is just running past, <laughs> apparently. Apparently the pig was just running past and he slipped on its uh, antler it was wearing because the pig was on its way to a stag do. <laughs> so my next question is, the boar that killed Robert Baratheon in the boar's prime versus Brienne. Yeah, so now this is a worthy this, contender. We don't know. We don't it know. depends. If the pig is post the stag party, mm -hmm. do you have that in America? Is that what it's called? Stag, a stag do. Uh, if it was if it was a hungover pig, okay, then I think maybe ooh, it could be different. You know, no, it could be easily defeated if the pig's hungover. The pig could be defeated. Yes. The pig, but if the pig wasn't hungover, if the pig was on its way, in his having already killed a man with a comedy antler, <laughs> I don't know. I just hope I'm wearing that three hundred and thirty-nine thousand pound armor to protect me. <laughs> Um, so, the pig, I don't know. 
Um, I want to talk really quickly because in addition to being a giant Game of Thrones nerd, I also happen to be, so this is just for me, um, a, a major uh, Shakespeare geek. Um, and you're playing Titania in A Midsummer Night's Dream? Yes, I am. Yes. Um, so is it nice to finally be in a project where everybody knows how it ends? <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know what? Actually, there's some, uh, oh, there's some changes in that too. So I can't ask you about <laughs> and, I, and I signed an NDA <laughs> and I can't talk about it either. And it's just a play. <laughs> Well, <laughs> but I like to continue the theme, you know? <laughs> it's not talking about me. Let me hear about your day. Never mind about the 4,000 Shakespearean words I've got to hold in my mind. Okay. How's your day going? <laughs> um, but no, uh, to take it seriously, yes, I am really delighted. It's been eight years since I've been on a stage. Mm -hmm. and, but that's what I did. You know, that's what I first did when I was a child, was stage work. And um, I always wanted to do screen work. Uh, I was told I probably wouldn't be, wouldn't, um, because the world was a different place then. Ha! And um, uh, it's, it's exciting to me to play that part, particularly with the kind of changes that are in place with regards to examining the kind of dynamics between men and women and different forms of being a badass, even if you're queen of the fairies. Well, we have to end it there. Thank you so much for chatting with us. And guys, stick around. The Marvel Antihero Roundtable is up next. And let's give it up for Gwendolyn Christie. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks.